convened colleagues today to hear about the latest research in COVID-19 dynamics from an epidemiological and demographic um, perspective. And we're delighted to have uh, the World Pop team at uh, the University of Southampton join us along with colleagues from Facebook as well as a discussant from Statistics South Africa. So what we would like to do uh, today is to do two presentations um, and then have a short uh, intervention from our discussant before turning it over to uh, Q&A. I would ask please if you could put your uh, questions in the chat box as we're going through at any time. Those will be fed uh, through to me and then during the question and answer session we'll be able to get a bit of a discussion going about COVID-19 uh, migration and mobility and in particular about the use of uh, newest forms of mobility data to understand some of the um, emerging dynamics around the pandemic. So please let me just uh, first pass over to the World Pop team. I'll do a very very brief introduction so we don't take up too much time. The World Pop team at Southampton University is led by Professor Andrew Tatum. He's a Professor of Spatial Demography and Epidemiology. He will be joined by a number of uh, different presenters from the World Pop team that we're uh, delighted to host today. Um, not all of them will be able to join us um, at the moment, but I will let you know of all of the researchers who are involved in this particular piece of work. Uh, we have lecturer in infectious disease uh, modelling, Nick Runanunchai. He will be joining us. Uh, Shen Jie Lai, who is a senior research fellow at Southampton University working as part of the team. Uh, Alessandra Carioli, also a research fellow at the Southampton University World Pop team. Uh, Corinne Rukunanchai, who is a senior research assistant with the team, and Jessica Floyd, a postgraduate research uh, student. So we're delighted to have them join us and take us through the latest uh, analysis that they have been undertaking uh, using uh, COVID-19 uh, mobility data. We're also joined by Cecilia Zapala. She is the public policy manager in the Data for Good team at Facebook based in Brussels and we're delighted to have Cecilia presenting on Facebook's um, data capabilities and I'm sure we'll get into some interesting discussions a bit later on. And lastly, we're really delighted to have Diego Iteralde, who is normally a participant and always poses the most interesting questions. So I'm really delighted that this time Diego has uh, accepted the invitation to be a discussant. Diego is, of course, the Chief Director of Demography and Population Statistics at uh, Statistics South Africa. So thank you again, Diego, for accepting that invitation to join us. I'll hand over to Andy first. Um, he'll be sharing the PowerPoint presentation with the rest of the team members joining in uh, throughout the presentation. Thanks, Andy. Over to you. I think you're muted, Andy. Sorry. Thanks, Marie. Yes, sorry. <laughs> thanks for joining us and thanks for that introduction. Um, so, yes, I'm going to uh, start off this presentation and then hand over to other members of the World Pop team who've been leading a lot of this research. Um, so just to start off, um, we are a, a applied research and implementation group. There's around 30 of us at Southampton University. Um, a big focus on mapping population demographics, uh, counts, characteristics and uh, dynamics um, and trying to make everything as open as possible in terms of data peer-reviewed methods, um, and we have a lot of collaborations with um, UN agencies, including IOM. So um, it's great to be here to present this work. And we're going to, firstly, a bit of background on pandemics and human mobility, how we measure mobility, and then I'll hand over to Lai to talk about his work in, in China, um, and then Nick to talk about his work in um, regional connectivity in Europe. And then Alessandro will finish off on what's coming next. So um, what we're experiencing now is actually throughout human history, nothing new. Um, there's been some pandemics regularly throughout human history. Uh, some of them actually far bigger and far more deadly than what we're experiencing now. Um, but there are some components that are new. Um, and if we look back 
when we think about uh, a disease like smallpox and the speed it took to spread across the continent. We're looking at actually centuries to, to make that spread from endemic areas in India to, to China to Europe. We fast forward to the Black Death. Um, that then uh, emerged in China around 1333 and actually took just a decade or more to spread across to Europe and the UK. Then we look back to 1918 and the uh, what was called the Spanish flu, but the, uh, a major influenza pandemic. Um, there we're looking at global spread in a matter of months. So we start to see this acceleration of spread of pandemics. And then finally, looking here at H1N1, the swine flu um, from back in 2009, um, starting in Mexico and spread across the world here, we see in a matter of weeks. Um, and of course, what we're experiencing now is a disease that arose in, in China and is now in all countries of the world and actually made it there in more like a matter of days and weeks. So we're seeing this acceleration and question that um, I get all the time from my kids every day. Why, 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 why? Um, one component is the changing in human mobility. So as malariologist David Bradley decided to just do a little uh, experiment or not even experiment, asking his relatives to map out their entire life history. So this is great grandfather who lived in Kettering, uh, mapped out his entire life history. He didn't make it even to the neighboring town of Colby in his lifetime. His grandfather had access to uh, steam trains, public transport, made it to, to London in his lifetime. His father, as the cheaper personal transport became becoming much more widely available, was able to travel across Europe all the way down to, to Corsica from the UK. And then himself, um, his travel pattern looks much like I'm sure many of us on the, the calls. Um, global travel, um, he is a malariologist, so a lot of travel to Africa. But that expansion in just a matter of four generations of mobility is, is huge. And one component that's driving this is the, the global air network. So air travel in 1933, this was the, the network. You could travel a few places and it took a long time, about 10 days to go from London to Cape Town and a lot of stops and a lot of chances of crashing along the way. Um, nowadays, we, we have a picture like this where we can pretty much go anywhere and get from one side of the world to the other in, in 24 hours. So um, how can we actually start to measure and map this growing mobility? Um, importantly, there is what we call here traditional data sets and these remain vital. Um, household travel history surveys, cross-border and traffic surveys, census data, um, all providing information on different um, spatial scales and temporal frequencies. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, oh, I'm sorry, just to, these, are, these have been vital data sets across um, the last century or so in terms of understanding drivers of migration, mapping out uh, flows. Um, and so we have some epidemiological work from uh, Mansell Prothero uh, back in the 50s and 60s that did some really interesting work on um, understanding migration patterns. But what we're going to talk about today are uh, these other types of data set that are coming in really to, to complement those traditional data sources. So they come from uh, smartphone apps, from personal GPS, uh, from satellite night lights. Um, and the, the major one I think we're going to hear about most today is those coming from um, mobile phones, smartphones. And why these data sets um, come about? Firstly, if we're working with a, a mobile network operator, um, and I'm a phone user and I make a call or receive a text at 9.48 in the morning that gets routed through the nearest mobile tower and recorded anonymously for, for billing purposes. I then move to a different location um, that's, and make a call or receive a communication, receive a text that's at 10.48, that's routed through a different tower. So there's evidence that I've moved from one location to another location, um, dropping these kind of digital breadcrumbs along the way. And when we aggregate uh, all these anonymous tracks of movement um, across an entire country, uh, we get firstly beautiful artwork like this. This is millions of users across Bangladesh in three months just mapping out the, the, uh, the most popular movement routes. But it's also richness of data that we've, we've never had before. Importantly, these are biased data. Not everybody has a phone. 
not everyone's using a phone regularly and there are geographical dif differences as well. Um, uh, but uh, in terms of richness of data that we've, we've never had before. And there's also now advances um, as we all move to smartphones and we hear a lot about this from Cecilia with Facebook data. Um, but as we, we look at our phones and see traffic statistics of roads going red, uh, that's essentially smartphones slowing down, smartphones with GPS in them. Um, and Nick, who's on the, on the who's going to speak next, uh, led a study where we got some volunteers to, to give over their, their location histories, which most of us will have on our phones and compare that to other mobility sources and show that it's a really uh, detailed and valuable source of information. Importantly, again, we have to be careful with the biases and uh, the sensitivities of these data. But hopefully we'll hear how they can be valuable in terms of uh, modeling diseases. Uh, and these are becoming more widely available across the entire world. So again, we'll hear from Cecilia later on this. So how can we actually use these data for estimating disease movements and designing control measures? So here is where I'll hand over to my colleague, Lai, who led some work on that. Yes, thanks, Andy. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Andy. Yeah. Um, in the very early days of this pandemic, um, the, our World Pop group has already um, done some uh, analysis on the spreading risk of the COVID-19 within China and beyond China by using the mobility, mobility data. And uh, for example, this one, please. Um, next slide, yeah. Um, for example, we, uh, we we got the data from Baidu, the, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, search engine, Chinese search engine, engine in China, and also the, the map location, his, uh, have a lot of uh, map location history data, and we use uh, Baidu's users' uh, locations to look at the connectivity between uh, Wuhan and uh, other cities in China, and this video shows the incoming and outcoming flow of, uh, of Wuhan, and uh, such as the yellow bubble means the outflow, and the green color means the inflow. And you can see that after Wuhan slowed down, they have a very uh, small number of people you know, coming and leaving Wuhan. Okay, next one, please. Yeah, and. And we can see that based on this mobility data, we can estimate that, estimate that a lot of people already travel, uh, live in Wuhan before the uh, Chinese New Year. And, and such as this shows the, the, because the population movement pattern has a very uh, significant seasonal um, uh, phenomenon, uh, seasonal patterns uh, in, in China due to the uh, holidays such as the Chinese New Year and National Days. And you can see that the, uh, the, the city surrounding Wuhan have received more uh, travelers from Wuhan and also some other big cities like Beijing, Shanghai and Guangzhou in China have a uh, uh, higher risk of uh, uh, imported this virus from Wuhan. And here we also use the L travel data to look, to look at the uh, the risk of other countries or cities outside China. And you can see that the Southeast Asia and Europe and America looks like have a higher uh, risk um, to have this virus imported from uh, China. Yeah, and this one, please. And and further, we, we use the um, uh, patch epidemiological model to simulate the spread of this virus. And this model is uh, is a, a classical uh, epidemiology local, try to classify the population into the subgroups such as the susceptible population, exposure uh, population exposure to this virus, and the population becomes infectious, and then the population recovered or, uh, or isolated uh, to interrupt the transmission. And use this model, uh, this model, and combine with the mobility data, we can um, we can uh, define the how many people infected with this uh, virus might be travel from one country to another country or from one city to another city. And also, use, using this model, we can um, we can estimate or to assess the 
uh, the impact of different control measures. Next one, please. Uh, use, uh, here, so the one example we use in this model and uh, international population mobility data to estimate how many travelers infect with this virus and potentially um, um, and transmit the uh, the virus between the countries. And we can see the two peaks uh, here in the uh, in the and the early stage of of this pandemic. And the first peak is um, might be the more um, a traveler from China and spread this virus. And the second and bigger peak is uh, is is this the virus uh, might be. Uh, exported from other continents. So next one, please. Yeah, and uh, uh, because the, um, uh, it, it looks like the, uh, the outbreak in China have been successfully contained in China, uh, including the uh, travel registrations and the case isolations and uh, early detection. And, and the third one is the social distancing and contact reduction. And we try to use the model I mentioned uh, before to and uh, combine with the mobility data to um, to assess the effectiveness of these three types of interventions. Next one, please. And here is just uh, some preliminary result and the early stage of our, uh, our, our outbreak in China. It, it shows it looks like the early case detection and isolation have a uh, highest impact, and followed by the uh, intercity social deten, uh, social distancing and and uh, contact uh, reduction, and it looks like the like the, the lockdown of cities in Wuhan, especially in Wuhan and other city in Hubei, uh, might not have a very high impact because it, I, I guess it might be happened in the and the late stage of the population uh, movement uh, before the Chinese New Year, because already have a lot of people move out of the, uh, the city Wuhan or other cities. And uh, uh, yeah, and how can we um, uh, estimate the intervention um, in other regions? I would like to hand over to Nick to this section. Thank you. You might be uh, mute. Nick, are you there? Is that better? Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so after the work in China, um, we wanted to explore what would happen based on different scenarios of mobility um, in countries around the world. So we use uh, location history data from Google um, to supplant sort of the Baidu data in China, which we had from around the world. So next slide, please. Um, in this study, essentially, we wanted to see, you know, at this stage, countries had put in stated lockdowns, um, they brought cases down and they were thinking about what would happen when they lifted those uh, lockdowns and what might happen during future lockdowns. So we wanted to model the costs and benefits of international coordination. And we did this using the same uh, epidemiological model as what Lai presented. But here we simulated two different types of scenarios. So in the first case, we looked at what happened if um, countries synchronized their lifting and implementation of future lockdowns at the same time versus countries doing it in an uncoordinated, asynchronized way. Um, so putting them in at the different times. And the other uh, scenario we tested was early lifting. So what happened if certain countries lifted their um, lockdowns before others? So, uh, we had three main pieces of information that we used to inform these hypothetical scenarios. So we had the number of cases for throughout Europe from the European CDC. Uh, using those cases at early stages of the pandemic, we estimated R0 for each country. So you can see that on the right. And then we also had movement over time on the bottom. So here we jointly used some data from Google, the international country level data that we had, and also some data from Vodafone as well. 
Uh, one really important thing that we could do with that Google data and the Vodafone data is we could infer how effective lockdowns actually were. So what we did was we used the mobility patterns we saw in late March when all the lockdowns were in place across Europe. Uh, for the most part, we compared that against January and February of 2020 to infer how much movement actually reduced. In other words, trying to infer how effective their lockdowns were. So one powerful thing I think about this method is that we didn't assume how powerful, how strongly um, lockdowns would actually influence mobility and exposure. We had sort of this real world picture of how heterogeneous that manifestation of lockdown actually mattered across countries. And you can see this here on the right, where you see how much mobility reduced. For example, it moved, reduced a lot by late March in Italy and uh, France, uh, less so in Germany and Poland. So we use those four pieces of information to uh, simulate what happened firstly when uh, lockdowns were synchronized over time. So these were on off lockdowns. So you can think about the UK where uh, we came out of lockdown and now we went back into it over the course of December. Um, what happens if countries actually synchronize those across the entirety of Europe? And we found really huge differences. So on the right, you can see the cases across Europe over time in blue if the uh, lockdowns are actually synchronized and then in red you have if they're not synchronized and importantly if they are uh, coordinated if they're synchronized 90 percent of our simulations went to zero sort of community transmission by the end of the simulation whereas only five percent of um, simulations went to that case if uh, the lockdowns are asynchronized on the other end of it so um we looked at the lifting, so what happens if one country lifts their uh, NPIs early? And what we found was that it had a really dramatic impact on continental resurgence. So if certain countries lifted their lockdowns early, it could cause resurgence across the entire continent up to five weeks early. And this is obviously valuable time. It could be used to expand test and treating strategies um, as well as uh, vaccine rollout. It's critical for that. Um, there was a lot of variance in terms of which countries were most important. So you can see on the right, um, the countries in red, if those countries lifted their lockdowns early, that led to a much earlier resurgence of, of the pandemic. So sort of resurgence depended most upon what France, Germany, Italy, UK, and Poland did, whereas it depended a little bit less on what, say, countries like Austria, Switzerland, um, Norway, Finland did. So. And just to show you what that movement looked like over time, um, this is the Google data over the months. So you can see now we're in March where movement dropped really dramatically across the entire continent. And now you can see as you get into the summer, there's actually, um, as lockdowns are lifted, a recovery of a fair bit of that mobility, um, not just within country, but also some international travel gets restored as well. So essentially, uh, the take home message, I think, from this story is that we found really substantial variation um, spatially and temporally in terms of connectivity, um, in terms of transmission, in terms of R0, and in terms of lockdown effectiveness. Um, some countries, when they place lockdowns, it caused a much more dramatic in, uh, decrease in mobility than others. So because of that heterogeneous picture and because that means there's risk of spread to other countries, what that depends on what each country does. Um, coordination and synchronization of strategies is really important to prevent resurgence. Um, you know, obviously we were sort of simulating different hypothetical scenarios and these predictions um, are different realizations of what could have happened and they inform the difference of what happens when different countries synchronize uh, rather when they don't. Um, in reality, we might find that coordination across the entire entirety of Europe is infeasible, but you know, we can also look at this connectivity network to see if there are specifically, especially highly connected sub-communities that form travel corridors where maybe certain countries could coordinate and you don't actually need every country in Europe to work together. So here on the right, you can see some of that community detection analysis from our Google data. Um, and you can see countries in the same color are essentially more strongly connected than others. So it's more important that they coordinate rather than countries in different colors. So for example, um, France, Spain, and Italy form one group. So it would make for one really natural 
uh, coordination group within Europe. So that's it for me. I'll pass on to Alessandra, who'll talk about what's next for our work. Hey, thanks, Nick. So um, we've established the Alessandra, we're actually experiencing quite a lot of, sorry, mm -hmm. Alice. Uh, Alessandra, Alessandra, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but we're experiencing a lot of breakup. I can, I yeah. can take over, I guess. I not. think, um, uh, Adrian, because I, I just can't hear, it's breaking up quite a bit. Yeah. Andy, that would be great. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah that's fine. So, um, yeah, I think we're, <laughs> we're losing you, Alessandra. Um, okay, connectivity. Yeah, you can take so my to, car. Yeah. Ah, okay. It sounds good now, but okay. I can yeah. um, finish off. Um, yeah, yeah, but sure. yeah, some, some, Next next steps, I think, on our on our work here is to focus a lot on the, the seasonal mobility. And um, we saw that in the, the, the start of this pandemic which coincided with Chinese New Year and the, it's just the, it's the biggest annual seasonal movement of people on the planet. And, and it's those kinds of movements that can really change uh, the course of these uh, outbreaks and pandemics substantially. So we're looking a lot at these kinds of mobility data sets, linking up multiple different data sets. We're working with Facebook in the, in the UK to look at these, these changes seasonally. Um, but also, um, uh, as part of our wider World Pop work, gathering together a range of different geospatial data sets on population vulnerabilities. So this is some of the work that Alessandra has led, um, uh, modeling and assembling data on population age and sex structures. We see here, this is um, a map of the uh, the young and, and old, really showing the, the much younger populations across sub-Saharan Africa than in Europe, but great sub-national variations as well in many countries that are affecting uh, why some countries are seeing greater rates of hospitalization and death. Um, and also thinking about the delivery of, of vaccines and access to, to healthcare to be able to to achieve that. So um, mapping out the locations of health facilities um, where particular vulnerable groups are in relation to those facilities and distribution me mechanisms for that uh, delivery of the vaccine in some of the, the poorest countries. So I think we'll finish off here, but to summarize that hopefully you've seen now that these disease outbreaks are becoming more uh, rapid uh, and rapid spread than ever before. Um, and one of the key drivers is this change in mobility that we've seen over the last century, a huge growth uh, in reach and volumes. Um, these new forms of data are aiding our abilities to map, model and respond to the outbreaks. They're not perfect, there's biases and we need to validate and compare against more traditional data sets. Um, but integrating them and accounting for the, the geography and demographics is, is going to be vital to understand what's happening and what, what happened in this pandemic. I think we'll finish there and there's more information on our website. Thank Great, you. thank you very much um, indeed, Andy. And I'm sorry we lost you there, Alessandra, um, because your work on, on demography was quite critical. And I'm sure many people, like including myself, was thinking about the intersections with um, some of the demographic profiles and, and what that means going forward. So sorry that we uh, that we dropped out there, but we, I'm sure we will get questions um, in the Q&A discussion. And thank you very much, Andy, for picking that up and for the whole team presenting a, a very rich, um, and and fast moving uh, body of research and analysis that is is also looking forward to uh, the next big issues, especially in regards to vaccination rollout. And I'm sure we'll get into a discussion a bit later on that. I will now hand over to Cecilia 
uh, Cecilia, as I mentioned earlier, Cecilia Zapala is the public policy manager uh, for Data for Good within the Data for Good team at Facebook in Brussels. I'll hand over to Cecilia as she sets up her PowerPoint presentation and we look forward to, to hearing from you, Cecilia, and then we'll go on to Diego. Thanks, over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Marie and the all IOM team for inviting me today. Um, my name is Cecilia Zappala. I'm public policy manager in the Data for Good team at Facebook. And I'm going to walk you through uh, today through uh, some of our mobility data sets. But before, I just wanted to quickly introduce what the Data for Good team does at Facebook and what's the history of that. So this team was born around three years ago um, under the uh, consideration that Facebook had uh, quite some data that could have been helpful in disaster response. So we really realized that um, we could, we were actually able to help some disaster response organization to maximize, to, to be more effective in the disaster response because we could detect uh, where population was living, uh, how it was moving during a disaster and so on and so forth. So everything started there. And then, as you can imagine, in the last year um, with COVID, the work really grew and uh, focused very much on, on, on this pandemic. Um, the team also grew a lot. It's a cross-functional team. Um, there are some people in the public policy area, like myself. There are engineers, data scientists, economists, geographists, and, and you name them. So, um, I wanted to um, give you just a very quick overview of the products. We call them products. Of course, they are uh, mainly data sets that we have um, and that we share either publicly or with our uh, partners, so NGOs and academics, to help them doing work uh, in the humanitarian and societal space. So the first family of data sets we have, it's called Maps for Good, and those are the data sets I'm going to talk about more, more in details today. Then we have a second family, which is called Surveys for Good, and it's pretty much surveys uh, that we um, that we ask to Facebook users. Of course, within this, um, this family, we always cooperate with universities, so it's them really um, processing the data, collecting the data, and, uh, and providing analysis. We did a bunch of surveys on COVID, um, and we will um, continue to do so in the future. And then the third family, it's called Insights for Impact. And with this um, number of data sets, we generally cooperate with uh, um, non-profit in order to monitor uh, public posts around a specific issue. One example uh, was Zika in Brazil. So we try to detect uh, people's, feel well, Facebook users' feeling um, around a certain issue to help those organizations to better target specific campaigns. So vaccination would be another, um, another theme that we address uh, with Insights for Impact. Um, another uh, aspect I wanted to mention is that some of our data sets are fully public, so available to everyone who wants to see them. We upload them um, in the humanitarian data exchange or Amazon Web Services data exchange. And those would be uh, typically the data set, a little bit less privacy sensitive that use uh, maybe data um, which are not Facebook data. And we're going to uh, see that more in detail later on in the presentation. Uh, while other uh, data sets are under controlled access. So as, as I said before, uh, we share them only with, with our partner organizations who sign a data licensing agreement. Uh, and we do that because those data sets are typically more privacy um, uh, sensitive. And so this is a, a, a better way to, um, to, to, to deal with those kind of data sets. And the same approach, of course, we have it for the surveys and the insights for impact, but I'm not going to go into the details. So I'm, I'm going to 
through a number of examples in case studies now, um, I wanted to say that you can see all of them, all the case studies that have been developed uh, using our data sets are available on our website, which is datafreegood.fb.com. So I would really invite you to go there and uh, and have a look if you are interested in, in, in things that I'm going to tell you uh, that I'm going to tell you today. But let's start with the first uh, example in the first data set, which is called high resolution sediment layer. What is what is it? This is basically a very high resolution population density map. And another thing I wanted to uh, to say is that this is not um, typically a mobility data set. It's a, a population density map that shows where uh, people live. So you can see here um, a little bit more of an, of an explanation. So what we do is that uh, we start from satellite images, which are publicly available, and we apply to them our um, machine learning, our artificial intelligence to detect on those um, satellite images where buildings are. And this is a very similar exercise that, that everyone could do looking outside the window of a plane and, and, and trying to detect where are human buildings and where are not to infer where population lives. And so you can see an example here. This is a small village in um, Namibia, which has a few buildings which are made out of concrete. Others, the majority actually, are made out of more uh, traditional material. And the machine detects uh, where those buildings are and therefore where population lives. To this population um, kind of location, we overlay data about census to see where specific kind of population live. So you can see here an example of Nigeria that shows where the population over 60 years old mainly live. And as you can imagine, this has been quite helpful to a number of, um, of organizations to uh, help COVID-19 uh, support measures because it could really illustrate uh, where vulnerable population was living. Let's go to the next data set, which is movement range maps. This data set is also openly available to everyone who wants to consult it. Um, differently from the other uh, one, this data set uses uh, Facebook data, and namely, um, it uses location data of people who use Facebook on their smartphone, as Andy was mentioning before, and who have opted into sharing their location data with Facebook. So this is an opt-in uh, feature that we have. And we developed these this maps to answer uh, the question with COVID-19, whether people are moving more or less since the beginning of the pandemic, and how are um, lockdown measures being effective? Are they really uh, you know, able to contain uh, movement, movement of people? So you can see here how uh, the data set works. So we detect mobility across specific area, mobility of Facebook users, as I mentioned before, and we define mobility as traveling across level 16 Bing tiles. This is a bit of a um, specific term. It is not other than a square, uh, 0.6 kilometer per 0.6 kilometer. And so we detect how people move across those uh, those little square. So before the pandemic, I could travel every day uh, across maybe 10 or 15 or those tiles because I would go to work, then I would go to have a drink with my friends, then I would go to pick up my daughter at school. So I would travel those number of tiles. Now, with uh, lockdown measures, working from home, I would probably travel z one, I would probably stay put in my tile, or I would travel maybe two of them. And so what we did is that we um, detected the movement of people across those tiles, we aggregated the numbers, and then we surfaced the numbers on a county level. So what you can see 
in this chart is counties in the US. Um, of course, we do that in in every country globally almost. Um, and, and so we would surface the data for the equivalent of county in um, in other country. It would be the province in Italy, the département in France. And so this uh, really shows how mobility dropped uh, after the, um, the uh, beginning of the uh, pandemic. And you can see also here another interesting visualization because uh, we created this uh, metric of percentage of population, which in a specific time would basically stay put, not move, uh, stay within their own tile. And so you can see that at the beginning of the pandemic, people were, I mean, there was a low percentage of people staying put. With the spread of COVID-19, more and more people were actually not moving. And then with the relaxing of measures uh, a little bit later, people started to move again. So it's a pretty interesting visualization over time. Um, next data set, it's the, oh my God, I'm sorry, I went back. So next data set is called the social connectedness index. So what this um, what this is is um, if you check the, the the map on the right side, we take we start from a specific area. In this case, is the province of Lodi in Italy, which was the one of the most hardly hit by COVID, and we actually. Um, assess how people in this province are connected with people in other regions in Italy. And when we say connected, we mean what are the number of, of Facebook friendship ties from people in this province um, with people in other in other region. And of course, we can do it starting from any place in the world to any place in the world. So you can see on the right map how people are um, sorry, in the left map, how people are connected to each other across Italy. And this is very interesting because if you check the map on the right, in fact, you can see how um, COVID-19 cases was spreading. And you can see that this really mirrors the social connection ties uh, within Italy. So it's it kind of uh, rejoins a little bit what Nick was mentioning before. The level of connection really is a proxy to analyze and to foresee how the pandemic could spread in, in a specific region. Um, so I forgot to say that this data set, Social Connectedness Index, is also um, available openly um, in our website on in the Humanitarian Data Exchange. Now let's go to the data sets that are um, under um, license agreement. So the first one is the Facebook disease prevention maps, which is a little bit more complex because it's cross metric. And this once again responds to the, um, to the need to detect whether uh, people move um, during a, a disease and how do they move. So, once again, we have we use as a as a basis a movement um, across styles. So we use actually three uh, sub data sets to create those um, disease prevention map. The first one is the Facebook population. So in every tile, we take a baseline that in this case would be um, before uh, the the start of the COVID nineteen pandemic. And then we assess whether in a specific moment, the population in, a, in an area is more or less compared to the baseline. Then we take a movement data set. So for two pair of places, we detect, again, we compute a, a, a baseline and then we detect whether people move more or less between those two points compared to the baseline. And then the third data is connectivity, of connectivity, which is less important in a, in a COVID um, in a COVID space, it's more important, for instance, for disaster response. And what we uh, understand uh, from this uh, disease prevention prevention maps, and you can see that uh, quite clearly in the map, which is San Francisco uh, during um, in after the the beginning of the pandemic of COVID nineteen, is that 
the tiles in um, in blue are the tiles where there are less people, sorry, more people than uh, compared to the baseline. And the parts in red are parts where there are less people compared to the baseline. So you can see that the area of San Francisco, the areas of the, of the university, Berkeley, um, Stanford, uh, have less people compared to the baseline to before the, the the spread of the pandemic, the beginning of the pandemic. And then the vectors define this um, the, the movement of people, as I said before. So what you see is um, a change in movement um, compared to the baseline. So you can see how inbound movement towards San Francisco was dramatically reduced um during the first uh, phases of the pandemic once again uh in order to uh create this uh, these maps we use um data of facebook users that have enabled location information on their mobile phone um of course this uh the disease prevention maps have been used in a range uh in a variety of ways and countries i wanted to just show very quickly an example from uh, india that actually showed how um after the the beginning of covid 19 uh, there was a population reduction in the cities so movement in uh, towards the cities was uh, was reducing but there were other trends of movement uh, in other parts of the countries in of the country and this was helpful to actually foresee as well potential new covid-19 hotspots if you are interested as i said you can go to our website and, and read the study um next map is uh, called collocation maps map in this um tries to address the problem of whether what's the, what's the probability that people uh, from two geographic regions were in contact for a meaningful enough time to actually transmit the the coronavirus so this data and you can see an example uh, from the university of taiwan um, on the screen so this data uh, take a pair of places, X and Y, let's say Brussels and Geneva, and then it kind of assess the probability that two random people in Brussels, one in Brussels and, and the other one in Geneva, can be in contact, so within the same um, 600 meter per 600 meter tile I was mentioning before, in a given time for five minutes over the period of, of uh, one week. So. What's the probability of collocation between those two people, one in Brussels and one in um, in Geneva? And so, this these data are then aggregated and once again surfaced at country level, county level. So you can see them for the you know the the, the administrative region, and they provide uh, um, uh, information um, on how again how could um, the the spread of the pandemic be foreseen because population in a country that is particularly affected are in contact with population in another uh, region that could be um, either in the same space or, or, or much broader, much farther. Um, and then finally, I wanted to touch upon the uh, travel patterns data set. Um, and in this case, the question was, what are uh, the movement patterns between countries uh, compared to the pre-COVID uh, pre uh, levels? So you can see here um, uh, the travel patterns that basically shows comparisons of the number of Facebook users that move large distances. So across countries by plane or by, by train, and so this comparison again is based on people who are using Facebook on their mobile phone, who have shared location information. And so for a given time, we can see how people travel across um, the national boundaries. And so this is also useful to, um, to kind of help epidemiologists to find regions which are at bigger risk of exposure of COVID-19 because there are people traveling from regions that actually have a higher rate of virus infection. 
So I can stop here um, for the time being. As uh, I said, um, please go and, and check our website if you're interested. And also, if you have uh, very specific questions, please email me. Uh, there's my email on the screen. And thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Cecilia. That was a very, very, very rich and very interesting um, presentation. Of course, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions um, on that. And and certainly we have um, a, a, a fantastic discussant too to lead into the Q&A. Uh, you mentioned a, a lot during your presentation, uh, the collaborations with academics and with NGOs, and of course, with the humanitarian data exchange, particularly around crisis uh, events and so forth. But uh, we thought it would be interesting to bring in uh, Diego because Diego is, um, of course, as I mentioned, the Chief uh, Director of Demography and Population Statistics at uh, Statistics South Africa. So from a uh, state perspective and from a government perspective, um, it is an interesting sort of dynamic in regards to the mobility and other data that is being accumulated uh, by Facebook, by Google, as mentioned um, earlier, uh, in terms of supporting member states and their responses to something like COVID-19. So with that, let me hand over to Diego to offer his uh, remarks on both presentations and then we'll head into the Q&A. Just a reminder too for participants, um, please feel free to put your uh, questions, comments in the chats, and then we can go into the Q&A after Diego. Thanks, Diego, over to you. Thank you very much, Marie. And thank you very much to the IOM Research for giving me the opportunity to be part of this uh, webinar. Uh, it actually brings together two, two of the themes that uh, drive me the most and uh, which uh, attract most of, most of my interest and that obviously being COVID and the issue of mobility or migration uh, of, of people over time. Um, I'd like to first of all start off by thanking the, the presenters, both from the World Cup program as well as Cecilia from um, Data for Good. Uh, besides being very interesting presentations, I think I learned a lot about what the potential opportunities are uh, with regards to this kind of data. Um, I, th I think we are living in a, in a in a time now where the use of, shall I call them alternative or new data sources, particularly around mobility in tracking COVID-19 indicators, can no longer be sidelined. It's no longer a a, a side activity that that a niche group of academics do, but it's it really is something that is becoming very much mainstream. Um, the use of mobile devices or the use of tools like Facebook advertising are sources that need a lot more exploration uh, for us to glean more, more, more uh, um, knowledge with regards to what it, what it can tell us, not only with regards to COVID-19, but with regards to various dynamics uh, that are in, in our society. Uh, it's also uh, what I think is, is, is really important, and I think that uh, Andy touched on this, is that it's critical to integrate traditional sources with these new data sources. Um, we, we are not saying that we want to replace one source of data with the other, uh, but we really want to integrate uh, what new technology is able to offer us with, uh, what, we are, uh, with, with what we already have. A very simple example, if, if we take uh, aerial photography with remote sensing, we can tell almost in real time where uh, new communities are developing, but we won't know anything about, about the, the people who are living in them. And that's where censuses and surveys and other forms of data collection come in handy so that we, we know what the characteristics of those people are and we, we don't leave them behind as we move to our 2030 goals uh, of the of the SDGs. Um, I think it's also important to look at relationships between geolocations in, in, in order to be able to build any predictive element into any index or model. So in other words, what are the key routes between big cities and uh, major or smaller towns? What is the impact of roads or airports or harbors? Um, and, and how does that, that impact the, the movement of, of, of people? Of course, 
many nations around the world have have been through lockdowns where this movement has been been curtailed um and uh that kind of movement has really come to a a full stop um so i think that in in terms of COVID 19 how the movement has taken place uh, after lockdowns have been relaxed or lifted and how that impacts impacts on this the spread of the pandemic is an important issue to take in, into consideration um I think one thing that uh, we, we probably haven't spoken about is that it's important to discern between migration and mobility, uh, whereas the former is a well-defined demographic phenomenon, which, which I, I've been part of uh, with the UN expert group on international migration statistics uh, in defining migration and a whole bunch of other related terms. Uh, mobility is a much broader concept, uh, and but far more relevant towards the handling and the management of COVID-19. Um, so as much as mobile devices are able to indicate to us how people are moving or where they're moving to or from, uh, we, sh we should not confuse this with, with the actual act of migration, which, which has got a separate element attached to it. Um, yeah. What's uh, Noticeable is the relationship between mobility and the spread of the pandemic in, in many ways. Uh, I, th I think that uh, the two presentations today have, have indicated um, various ways in, in which movement of people have resulted in the, in the spread of the disease um, over time. Uh, from its origins, from its genesis, but also as uh, resurgences are, are, are occurring. And uh, we can't really avoid or ignore the issue of mobility uh, in this regard. Uh, one thing that I feel very strongly about though is um, capacity building around these new, new sources is really important. I don't think that it's enough for us to say what is available and what we can do with various tools but uh, in order to get various countries around the world um, looking at this data, using data and maximizing on it, um, I think it's necessary to capacitate countries around the world on how to ex explore such tools. How do they access them? What does, it, what does it tell you? What are the limitations and how can governments around the world make use of that? Um, we, we have seen, I think, um, uh, Nick was speaking about the impact of lockdowns um, in, in Europe, but uh, many countries at this point in time are going through second waves or the, 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 the beginning or are right in the middle of second waves, which are anachronous and are not, not occurring simultaneously or not occurring at the same time. And that's, that's exactly what we see in South Africa, where, where two of the provinces are um, finding that they are uh, experiencing the, the, the beginning stages of this second wave um, and uh, using this type of mobility data and uh, looking at other epidemiological uh, indicators, I think is the way to go in trying to manage this second wave without going into a hard lockdown, which I don't think anybody wants or that we can uh, um, afford after, after a winter with, uh, with the hard lockdown that we had. Um, this kind of leads me into the experience of South Africa and very briefly, I mean, the, the outcome of COVID-19 in South Africa has been not as bad as what we thought it may be in March. Uh, I think that the young age structure, which, uh, which has been al alluded to in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, has been partly responsible for that. Um, urban centers where, where, there is, where there is a far greater diversity of age structures uh, have probably been hit harder, uh, not only because of the age structure, but because of the bigger population and intermingling between people in larger cities. Um, the government of South Africa set up what was called a National Coronavirus Command Center. And uh, feeding into this command center was a, uh, it, it was called the 
NET joints, the national joint, joint committees which uh, advise this command center. Uh, various work streams were identified in, the, in this uh, NAT joints, and one of these work streams was the data and statistics work stream, which Statistics South Africa and other partners were involved in. So in this work stream, we looked at issues around mobile data, actuarial models, epidemiological models, pollution maps from uh, um, weather services, uh, and any other source of data which would look at the three main components of COVID-19, those being the health impact, the social impact, and the economic impact, um, including issues now of the, of the resurgence. Um, speaking of the economic impact, Statistics South Africa yesterday just released quarterly GDP figures, uh, just to give you an indication of the impact of, uh, of the lockdown. That in, in quarter two, um, there was a 16.6% drop in GDP and in the third quarter, once uh, lockdowns were relaxed, a 13.5% recovery was, um, was uh, experienced. These are all quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted and analyzed um, um, indicators. Then um, whilst many sources uh, uh, such as the ones uh, showcased today need to be explored, I think there are key indicators have been identified to measure the impact COVID-19 has had on South African society and a dashboard to this extent has been developed uh, which is being shared on Google Data Studio. Um, but uh, I, I think that there's still a lot of uh, the type of, of work and the type of indicators that we've seen today in this webinar which need to feed into this particular dashboard. Um, in this dashboard, we also include data on, on educational institutions as well as a municipal barometer to see what the impact has been at municipal levels, particularly um, economic impacts in that regard. Um, the, in the case of, uh, well, there's, the, there's also something to consider is the case of mobility before, during and after lockdown um, in, 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 in South Africa and that when Lockdown was um, introduced on the 26th of March. We found that leading up to the 26th of March, many people moved to where their family homes were, away from the big cities, and would, would spend the first, what, what was thought will just be three weeks of lockdown, but which ended up being a lot longer, movement into smaller, more uh, remote villages where their family homes are. And as uh, it was realized that lockdown is going to be a lot longer than three weeks, a window uh, of opportunity was given for people to return. Um, and this kind of movement certainly had an impact as we were moving towards the peak. There's also the issue of the culture of funerals in South Africa to take into account. Um, funerals are a, a big cultural and social event. Um, with uh, large groups of people usually moving from, from region to region to attend funerals. Funerals were limited to only 50 people during lockdown and the so-called after tears uh, reception, which is usually a social reception which takes place after the funeral, um, also needed to be managed because they were seen as epicenters of, um, of uh, super spreader events, uh, if I can call it that. Just this week, the President of the Republic has announced that no after tears parties or receptions after funerals will, will be permitted in certain regions where the resurgence um, appears to be stronger. Then just a, a two, two final comments in uh, closing uh, is that it is evident that the demands for the data are more and that they're needed in real time, uh, particularly to manage a health crisis such as COVID-19. And to do this, we need to invest in infrastructure of new data sources and in their application and interpretation uh, as well, and, and, there are, and, this, and the skills that are required in order to take us forward. Um, I think also in this regard that uh, resources such as the Data Innovation Directory on the Migration Data Portal hosted by IOM JINDAC are an invaluable resource in this regard. So thank you very much to the presenters. Apologies if I overstretch my five minutes. Um, and thank you very much to you, Marie, for this opportunity.
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Diego, and great to bring in some of the experiences uh, of South Africa more recently, um, including in relation to the public health, but also the economic kind of impacts that we're certainly looking at going forward. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat. I also have uh, a couple of questions of my own really kind of to start the conversation. Uh, we often hear about some of the risks and some of the real challenges in terms of um, the new data sources that we uh, you know, certainly have emerged in the last decade as being very powerful um, forces, uh, both from a public policy perspective, but also from you know, a privacy perspective, because they raise a whole range of new issues that haven't really existed with population survey, census data, and other um, academic type of outputs related to uh, behavioural uh, economics, for example, and uh, decision making in terms of movements. What we have been talking about today a lot is looking at monitoring, trying to assess behavioural impacts and the, the nexus with public policy determinations. What are we talking about in terms of responses, their effectiveness uh, in regards to this particular pandemic, but also as pointed to by, by Andy and the World Pop team in terms of vaccination sort of rollouts. So a couple of kind of key issues uh, keep coming up in, in that regard, and I'm very interested to hear from the World Pop team and Cecilia, especially in regards to privacy. Uh, we're hearing more and more over time of the so-called gold standard of um, privacy being differential privacy. And so I'd like to hear about their experiences with differential privacy, both from a kind of a policy perspective, but also from a uh, methodological perspective and, and what sort of limitations that puts on kind of some of the data analysis and in terms of integrating it with um, more traditional, if I can call it that, more traditional underlying data sets around population. Um, there's also, of course, the aspect that has come up again and again throughout all of the presentations, including uh, Diego's remarks and intervention at the end in relation to biases within the data. Uh, I, it was interesting to hear Cecilia talk about the Facebook population. You know, we're so used to talking about, you know, the population of a country or a subpopulation uh, within a particular community or region, geographic region. But what we started to talk about is the Facebook population, which of course is um, global, but it's highly segmented. And of course, when we're talking about something like uh, COVID-19, which as Diego and all of the presenters pointed to in terms of having very significant impacts on particular age demographics. There's also a lot of research to talk about, you know, minorities, um, including migrants uh, within those uh, populations. But we know, for example, that age is a really big factor in terms of impact. What that might look like going forward as we move into other coronaviruses, unfortunately, this is our kind of new reality. There's a lot of research on on the fact that they're, they're increasing, the potential for big coronaviruses going forward is not going to abate. And we've seen in previous pandemics that there has been a very, very different impact in regards to age uh, population groups. You know, the, the so-called Spanish flu in 1918 had a very different impact in terms of age uh, and other demographic uh, variables. So with those, I might hand over uh, to the World Pop team. I'm not sure if Andy, if you wanted to take those or pass those off into uh, other members of your team around privacy, differential privacy in particular, and, and how that works. And also then in terms of some of the uh, challenges and risks that come with a very biased uh, kind of data set and a view of the world that is changing dramatically because of the data that we have at our fingertips. So over to you first, Andy, and then we'll then we'll go through the other presenters. So I can I can start off. Um, I guess so. Yeah, a lot a lot a lot to cover there. But um, firstly, I think I would say um, a lot of the the sensitivities with these kinds of data sets come um, from uh, there's a lot of analysis that are looking at more individual level movements and very small area patterns. I think firstly it's when using these data sets it's under it's an understanding of what is actually going to be useful to end users and policy decisions. And often that's that's at an at quite an aggregate level. There is actually no need to go down to 
individual levels um, in tackling some of the challenges that are being faced by policymakers um, and, and also understanding the dynamics of this pandemic. Um, and, and that then involves very aggregate population level flows with like traffic statistics um, where these concerns about um, privacy become, I think, a lot less than if we are dealing with individual level data. Um, and also, yeah, just to, I think, to echo what, what Diego said, that these, these data are biased and on their own, they are perhaps not, <laughs> not so useful. It's when the power comes and the integration um, these can add more, more spatial detail, more temporal frequency, these kinds of new data sets, um, but only really when we understand those biases and integrate them um, either in an epidemiological model to, um, to understand that, try and get a handle on flows of infections um, or with ideally with household surveys on phone ownership um, with other forms of mobility data sets. And when we talk about the Facebook population, there's also the Google population, and then there's the Vodafone population, There's uh, and then there's household surveys asking about phone ownership. And then, so the more that we can bring together, and the more that actually, although we won't get, we probably won't get a definitive answer, the more these data sets all line up and show similar patterns, gives us confidence what we're seeing is not, not so biased. And the more we can also understand what are we missing? Um, where are the uncertainties? And that can be very important if we are talking about a disease that affects the elderly and we're actually looking at movement patterns of, um, of the younger population, um, which in some policy relevant questions can be still useful in terms of the spread. But in other cases, in terms of vulnerabilities, um, we may be completely missing <laughs> and, and providing advice that's actually misleading. So yeah, I think there's, there's importance here for, for being as open as possible about these biases in any kind of analysis that's done and trying to, to link together different data sets to understand those uncertainties. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else from our team or I can hand over to Cecilia who can, has more technical insights on the differential privacy and things like that. Yeah, if I can add just uh, a little remark on the demographic concept. Mr. Celia, you're breaking up again. I think we're losing you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you can you can type in the chat. It could be a, a solution in some of the points. Or turn off your camera because that when you turned your camera off, we were able to hear you uh, very clearly. So yeah, try again, Alessandra. Doesn't seem like it. Adrian, yes, oh, okay. we can yes. hear you with when your camera is off. Thanks, <laughs> Alessandra. Go ahead. Ah, you're on mute. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. Is it working now? Yeah. Never mind. Yes. Can you hear Go me? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I will just add very briefly that the direct consequences of COVID is uh, the death of males of, uh, of uh, over 70 years old. But of course, there's the indirect con um, consequence of, uh, especially in developing countries, of not providing 
uh, healthcare to those that are most vulnerable. For instance, if we think about pregnant women, so uh, antenatal and natal care uh, for deliveries, uh, vaccination campaigns have been put to an halt, uh, HIV and all these sorts of uh, health issues that have been uh, put aside to face uh, for the COVID emergency. Um, that was just Luckily, I'll be on mute again. Thanks, Alessandra. I'm, I'm glad we could get you um, your audio at least. I'll hand over to Cecilia now. Please, Cecilia, over to you. Yes. So, um, first thing on privacy. So, uh, just as a caveat, we have actually an academic paper that goes very much in detail uh, on our differential privacy approach. So, I'm not going to go too much in detail today. And I would encourage everyone to um, either find this paper, it's available on our website, or email me if you want more details. That said, obviously, uh, privacy, it's at the core of, of what we do, of our data sharing. We always, I mean, the slogan of our team is really um, make available our data set in a privacy protecting way. It's super, super important. And I think it, I, what I can say is that our privacy approach is really on different layer. So the first layer is this um, different level of sharing, uh, different approaches uh, regarding sharing. So as I said before, some data sets are available publicly, updated on human humanitarian data exchange. Other um, data sets are available only to our partners, of obviously um, to minimize privacy risks. Then there is a second layer, which is a focus on users' consent. So, as I said before, most of our mobility data sets, actually all our mobility data sets, are based on people who actually have consent and so actively went into their location uh, settings and Facebook and say, yes, I want to have location settings on. So, they are also informed about the um, you know, what the implication is to, to enable location. And, and we assume that they are um, absolutely uh, agreeing with uh, the fact of using the location data for uh, scientific research purposes. And then there is a third layer, which is um, the kind of more uh, technical layer in a way. So there are techniques that we use that we apply to the data sets to make sure that uh, they are, I mean, that privacy is protected. So there can be less sophisticated technique like aggregation, as Andy was mentioning before. It's not, I mean, in, in for uh, the researchers, the, the NGO, it's not important to know who exactly uh, is in which location and which time. Aggregated data are sufficient to build modeling. So aggregation is definitely something that we do in all data sets. Um, we also add a small amount of random noise to, to the tiles to make the true counts really impossible. We use another technique which is called smoothing, uh, which basically is a weighted average of the different tiles um, between tiles in a space and the, the immediate the tile which is immediately next to it. We also uh, drop the um the tiles which have two small counts and that could um you know entail some privacy risk for the user so in in the different data sets uh we drop uh, specific um counts when the counts is not high enough we we totally drop it so all of this to say and, and obviously differential privacy um so all of this to say that privacy it's really at the core and uh and it's something that really drives our activity since the beginning of um of, of of data for good of the building of the team. Just a quick word on the bias, uh, and I wanted to very much subscribe to what Andy said. Uh, our ambition is not to drive, um, to kind of influence a uh, specific decision or a modeling with only our data. We are very conscious that our data are uh, limited because they reflect the Facebook population, which is, especially in certain areas, is definitely not the majority of the population. Uh, it's not the particularly vulnerable population in some areas. So it's very important to be extremely mindful of that and to combine as much as possible our data with other data sources to create uh, 
less biased model but but just to say that that uh, for us it's absolutely uh, obvious that um there are bias uh, obvious bias in in the data that we provide Great, thank you very much, Cecilia. I just wanted to see if um, Diego wanted to add anything. Uh, otherwise, I've got further questions in the chat that have come through. Yeah, I, I, I can just add that uh, obviously um, confidentiality for a national statistics office is is um, critically important. Uh, all of the data that a statistics office releases needs to take that in, into account, and we we would not re release from any of our census or surveys information that would enable somebody to be um, uh, identified. Um, in this regard, uh, as, as we were navigating through how to manage the coronavirus pandemic in South Africa, uh, there were a lot of calls from the public indicating that they were weary of being followed or being tracked by, by the state. And um, and that they were not they were, that there was a high level of reluctance in this regard. So the the National Department of Health put together a, a free app, which uh, uh, provided your Bluetooth and your um, mobility uh, settings on your smart device are switched on. It it would actually indicate using Bluetooth whether one Bluetooth user was in close proximity with another Bluetooth user who had registered and, and, and had uh, indicated that they had tested positive for, for COVID-19. So in, in this way, data is collected without any personal identifier, um, without uh, finding out where you live or where you work or uh, what your movements are, but simply by identifying that uh, one person with the Bluetooth switched on was in contact with another one, uh, where one of the two had had been had been positive. So I think that uh, this 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 has been a very successful innovation in in terms of uh, being an additional tool uh, to break the the chain of the of the virus uh, amongst communities. And that's a really good point, Diego, because we have seen uh, that there have been, say, some misinformation or disinformation campaigns about, you know, the collection of data about even vaccines coming through now, as we are as we are seeing, you know, some kind of quite outrageous cons conspiracy theories being put forward in different um, on different platforms and and through different users and so forth, and it leads to uh, um, questions related to the aspects in concerning data for good and public policy kind of uh, interconnections, but also messaging for good. And I'd be particularly interested, uh, particularly Cecilia, from your sort of perspective and, and you know, moving a little bit away from the uh, epidemiology and demography kind of aspects, but more into the public policy space. What's um, Facebook's experience um, in regards to say, if I can characterize it as messaging for good and countering some of the misinformation in relation to, you know, migration and migrants. We've got an interesting question in there about vulnerabilities, which I think we've talked about uh, in the previous kind of round of, of responses, but we, we're very conscious of the impact, increasing impact of these kind of conspiracy theories and, and the pains that, as Diego has pointed out, that some governments will go to to reassure populations, but nevertheless, some of this misinformation and disinformation does persist. Thanks. Yeah, th this is actually a great question that um, I I'm not the best person to to be able to answer uh, because, as you as you probably imagine, we have. A a big amount of people in the company who work specifically on misinformation, on vaccines, on ads, and so on and so forth. So what I can say from a very kind of a general perspective is that, of course, we consider in within the Data for Good team, we consider our activity as part of the overall um, broader COVID-19 response uh, set of instruments. So we did 
have uh, put in place uh, specific policies on misinformation on COVID and on vaccines. Actually, there was um, this week or last week, there was actually an announcement on, on some changes in our misinformation policies, specifically on vaccines. Um, we do use ads to help um, governments to target um, specific users on campaigns, again, around COVID-19 misinformation, vaccines. We have a number of, of products. We have a COVID-19 info center. Um, so we kind of provide those quick um, screen, you know, prompt on the screen to tell people, you know, um, COVID is this and that, but, you know, drinking, um, um, I don't know, I, I, it's called in English, but anyway, drinking whatever is not going to be helpful to, to prevent uh, the spread of the disease, to, to protect you from, from having COVID. So all of these measures are put in place. Of course, we can always do more, we can always do better, but um, um, again, we, we kind of, we didn't shed away from um, knowing that we do have a responsibility on uh, on misinformation um, around COVID-19 and vaccines. Great, thank you very much indeed. And um, and you're quite right. I mean, IOM is like a large organisation as well. So to, uh, I'm sorry to put you in that spot in terms of misinformation if it's not your area, but that is a really big and growing concern, of course, being highlighted, you know, very clearly by the pandemic and certainly something that partnerships um, going forward need to be working on much more closely uh, across a number of different sectors. I've got a really interesting follow up to some of the discussion in regards to kind of digital literacy, for example, and in the context of uh, platforms and apps and different providers having permission or requiring permission, say, for the geolocation opt-in type of um, location history features and what this means in different communities where there might not be high levels of digital literacy and understanding the implications of that, particularly for some of our vulnerable groups who may be beneficiaries in humanitarian crises, uh, in pandemics, for example. And I was particularly interested in finding out really from both from Andy, from a research uh, perspective and a scholarly perspective, his thoughts on that, uh, but also, of course, from Cecilia as well, in terms of the, the bigger issue of digital literacy and, and informed consent and really understanding those permissions. Thanks. Yeah, it's a it's a a big question and it's one that has been evolving for sure over over time. We've started working with um, mobile operator data back in 2007 and I think then it was a situation where um, the, the um, malaria control program could simply go to the offices of the, the mobile provider and come out with a hard disk and and there was there were no protocols in place, there was no consideration of these, these kinds of challenges. So thankfully, things have evolved a lot over time. Um, now there are strong recommendations about how these kinds of data should should be used to overcome some of what you've mentioned, particularly um, in terms of um, stronger, much stronger data protection laws being put in place across many countries that have I mean, they've, they've caused us many challenges in terms of projects that have had to be restarted two or three times because governments have adopted strong data protection laws. And that's a, that's a good thing. It's a frustration sometimes for people trying to work with the data, but it's, I think it's great that these protections are coming in. Now we're in a situation where data actually never, when we're working with a mobile operator, we're not, and we're not touching data at all. It never leaves the operator. Um, and there are much more, uh, I guess, protections put in place. And it's only again that, that aggregate and anonymized data that ever leaves. It's like essentially broad tra traffic statistics where no individuals can be identified. Um, but yeah, these, these problems still do exist. And I think this is an active research area of um, ensuring that the most vulnerable are, are protected and that they're aware of that I mean, these kinds of data are being analyzed all the time in commercial for commercial purposes. Whenever you sign up for a 
for a contract or uses data. That's, there's the small printers there that these these data are being used by the operators for for commercial purposes for understanding their customer database, and often that's not not well understood. So it's it's something that does need to be addressed for sure. Yeah. Indeed, thank you very much, Andy. And that's, I mean, that, I think that's really important, especially to see the changes over time that you've that you've spoken about and how things really have shifted and will shift. I think, um, as you've pointed to, even further. Uh, Cecilia, um, I'd love to get your perspective on this too. Thanks. Yeah, and I think it's a great question, and I wish I had an answer, which I unfortunately don't have. So I can, I can actually. Uh, take uh, my casket. So before I joined the Data Africa team, I was working on privacy for a number of years in Facebook. And in fact, uh, it, it is an issue. It is an issue trying to inform uh, Facebook users about what it means um, to select certain settings, to share the data or not share the data. At Facebook, again, there are a number of teams that work on, on, on digital literacy um, from a privacy perspective, from a safety perspective. Um, so it, again, not just on data for good. Now, specifically on data for good, obviously, um, digital literacy can be an issue as connectivity can also be an issue. So once again, I go back to um, to my point on, on data bias. We know that um, we can't reach all the population, probably the most vulnerable population, um, it's, it's difficult to reach. Um, probably the most vulnerable population is not able to kind of understand what are the implications of specific choices. And all of these make our activity, of course, not 100% perfect um, but as I said before we do with what we have we try to work on different sides on the misinformation side on the digital literacy side on the connectivity side on the um, on, on the kind of on, on, on many sides uh, in order to uh, make things better and, and try to do our work as uh, as best as we can but yeah I wish uh, <laughs> I wish this was not a problem but it is actually. Great, thank you very much, and uh, and I think it is it is kind of increasingly recognised as a real challenge. Uh, we often talk about capacity building for data, and we, and often we're talking about you know the the people who collect, the organisations who analyse data, but really it's also in terms of the um, people who provide data, and the the big digital literacy issue is a very significant one, especially for uh, populations who who may be. Um, very vulnerable because of their circumstances uh, in particular. Um, Diego, I'm sure you've got, I'll give you the last word. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but I know that this will be something that will be particularly close to your heart and part of your kind of role. So give you the last word and then I'll really just ask for final comments if uh, anything that uh, you wanted to kind of offer into the discussion or that has come to mind, I'll, I'll uh, let the final uh, round of Present presenters uh, offer their final remarks. So, Diego, over to you. Thank you. Well, um, I think that misinformation has a, a huge role to, the, to, to play and a huge reason why digital literacy should be something that is enhanced. There's often a lot of misinformation about what is this data being for, uh, used for, who is checking up on me, uh, the reason for for having to to share this kind of information, and uh, I think it's 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 it it has the potential to be a stumbling block to the exploration of this kind of um, information. Uh, so I think that communication is really really key, and assuring people that uh, there there is there is no uh, individual level surveillance, which is uh, on, ongoing, is uh, really important for for us to to be able to develop this and to capitalize on this more. One thing which I also wanted to add on was the issue of remittances. I think uh, remittances is one aspect of migration which COVID-19 has impacted the most. I think uh, the World, World Bank had uh, indicated that uh, remittances are likely to drop by 20% um, through lockdowns and I know that there were other webinars that uh, dealt with this, but uh, from a demographic perspective, I think that, that uh, 
one of the, the main ramifications of lockdown and of COVID-19 has been around the slowdown in remittances, which, which has ultimately picked up. Uh, we, we have already spoken about uh, reproductive health services and uh, services to pregnant women, uh, which uh, had been highlighted. Um, and of course, uh, from a mortality point of view, the whole concept of excess deaths has certainly highlighted um, what, what the chasm is between reported deaths and actual deaths. Um, so I, I think that literature is, is awash with a, a lot of um, information. I think that social media, although it, although it has its uh, downside, uh, has, has most certainly brought the, the findings and the research and the knowledge being generated over this, this year much closer to home to many of us. Uh, this kind of webinar that we, that we are having right now would probably, probably have been a face-to-face -face meeting uh, over, over some other theme uh, other than COVID-19, uh, had there not been COVID-19. But it, it has brought the expertise of people around the world uh, into our own living rooms on a, on a weekly basis. I don't think there's been a week over the last five, six months that I have not been logged into a webinar of, of one sort or, or the other. And although you say that I ask a lot of questions, I, I sometimes wonder if, if uh, I'm, I'm not the nosy guy who asks too many questions. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think that this, this whole experience this morning has been uh, very much eye-opening. I think there's still a lot for us to learn, a lot for us to try and, and, and implement. And uh, once again, I just want to thank everyone involved for, for the opportunity to be part of this webinar this morning. Great. Thank you very much, Diego. And I was really referring to, to quality, not quantity of your questions. You always ask good questions. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, any final kind of thoughts from Andy or Cecilia? No, just thank you very much. And, okay. Yeah, great discussions. Great. Thank you very much. Cecilia, anything from you? We no, I, I yeah, you're okay. thank you as well. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, this, this chat this morning. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you for the excellent uh, presentations and, and for Diego's uh, intervention as well. Um, it is the final in our series for the year, but we will be resuming next year. And I think Diego is exactly right. It has um, been a bit of a silver kind of lining to a very dark cloud in regards to pandemic, the ability to bring people together from uh, various parts of the world with different perspectives, I think has only been enriching. Uh, and we've certainly been uh, heavily involved in not just hosting, but also participating in some. And I would encourage people uh, who are interested in remittances as Diego brought in. This is something that IOM is, is very much focused on and we do a series of analytical snapshots to try and make sense in, in very sort of short spaces of time, some of the new emerging findings, research and data. And certainly as it comes to remittances, we are seeing a very substantial shift and uh, the World Bank's revision of its projections of decline of international remittances is a case in point going from 20% to 14% uh, a few weeks ago. As we see um, some of the data emerging from central banks showing that informal remittance channels are being formalised out of desperate need. You know, we're, we're no longer seeing people travelling across borders and taking money back to family and friends and, and uh, extended families and so forth, that they are having to, to move into the digital world. And I think this is one really big um, unifying kind of aspect in regards to COVID-19. It has squarely placed us into a much uh, more significant digital world going forward, whether that relates to social care, whether that relates to epidemiology, whether that relates to mobility, whether that relates to remittances and also how we communicate uh, socially, we're, we're heading into uh, a very significant digital age with some of the challenges and the risks that we talked about this morning. So thank you very much for a very engaging discussion. Thanks to the participants. Special thanks to the IOM research team, uh, especially um, Adrian, 
uh, Josiane and Celine who've helped put together the webinar today, but also the webinar series over the last uh, six months or so. We look forward to uh, engaging further on the topic. This is not the end. It's only in really many regards the beginning. And we're wishing everybody um, a very safe uh, and happy new year. And we're all, I think, looking forward to saying goodbye to 2020 in many respects. So thank you again and thanks for joining us.